getting ready. Hi everyone, I'm Anouk, the marketing manager at GPO Audio and today I'm joined by Ansi from Amphion. I'm sure our listeners already know both Ansi and Amphion, but um, could you please talk a little bit about yourself? Um, if, if possible, I'd prefer to talk about Amphion, not myself. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. <laughs> uh, we are a 23 year old company out of Finland. Uh, we actually come from the, from the home side of things. Eight year, years ago we ventured into the pro world and, and it's been really uh, nice because I think we've finally found uh, our audience and, and, and it's been really really nice to be in this part of the world and, and music making world, sound making world and, and uh, it has really, let's say understanding this whole chain from what happens between the the, or from the mic to the all the way to the listener and listener be it in his living rooms mobile device whatever and car uh, it's been very helpful because the world is changing very quickly and and uh, I think the tools uh, have to kind of follow the fact that uh, that the way people listen to their music or how they make their music or sound in general has changed that the tools can remain the same for sure, for sure. I agree with you and we will dive deeper into the topic. But before we do that, um, could you please talk a little bit more about uh, the journey of Amphion, how it started out and yeah. Um, yeah, we are located in, in Kuopio, Finland, which is 400 kilometers north of uh, Helsinki. Uh, um, some people say that the reason why there's a lot of speaker manufacturing in that, in that part of the world is that that uh, of course it's very dark and cold during the winter time so you need to find something something to do inside and and and, and that two and a half months when uh, the temperatures are actually humane we have millions of mosquitoes so so again it's nice to be inside but but no jokes aside I think the true um, I mean we're all products of our environments and I think if something we are very blessed in a way that we are very close to the nature uh, it's a very quiet um, quiet rural area so so I think that has the fact that we are connected still as a nation we're probably connected to the to the nature as such and also um, I think an average Finn uh, it's much more comfortable listening than talking so that is of course beneficial when we are trying to design loudspeakers. Uh, yeah, um, and so let's talk a little bit more about the technology. So if we're talking technologically, um, what makes essentially your products so good and what differentiates them from the others on the market? And obviously the beautifully honest concept to uh, how do you carry that out throughout your products? Right. Um, of course, I think the, the, it's typical to the modern world that we're always trying to get something new, something flashy, something exciting. But uh, luckily there are trends that kind of remind us that uh, actually you don't have to do anything else. For example, when it comes to cooking, then select perfect ingredients, uh, use coal, the, the oldest cooking method in the world, and you can be that. And in many ways, this is what we are doing. Uh, I mean, the, uh, the basic technology of using dynamic drivers has been around for over 100 years. But funnily enough, there seems to be ways to still improve it and, and find ways uh, to, to get more performance out of it that, that relates to the modern world. Um, therefore, we have not get ventured, even if probably it would be uh, great from a marketing point of view, we stayed away from the DSP because I strongly believe uh, in making products with a long lifetime. Mm -hmm. And the problem with anything digital is that even if, may, if we, it may give you uh, cheaper, better products every day, it also prematurely ages everything it touches. Mm -hmm. And and this is in, in the such, by the time, uh, I mean, as long as the laws of acoustics remain the same, you will... You, you can ensure that it's, it's, uh, it has a, a value in, in, uh, in how it works. And, and of course, uh, a lot of interesting things are coming, uh, happening on the signal chain. I mean, it's been a radical change from big analog desk to working in the box. Um, and, and nowadays you can't really tell the difference when you're li listening to the result. 
uh, but the bottleneck I, still, I strongly believe has been in monitoring and that's why we are pushing our philosophies to push the, the acoustic design and that because whatever we can achieve acoustically we don't have to fix electrically and everything we can remove from from the product per se increases resolution and trans transparency and this is maybe the reason why an increasing amount of, of manufacturers, be they hardware or software uh, makers, are relying on our products because it's really, you hear everything that happens, small, smallest, smallest change to the component detail or, or, or component level or something that uh, you tweak in a software side. Because it's only the basic and like what, um, the only like the essential parts included, right? Yes, so it's, it's it simple. yes. I mean, it's it's part of the let's say part of the designing a good speaker. There are some problems. First of all, uh, the driver integration, and and that of course, uh, if there's an Amphion trademark, I mean, it's funny enough you don't even see a logo on the product, and and uh, of course, uh, my 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 teachers in the in the business school would not approve. And this is not the way to do a product, but this has become our trademark. But it's all for it's all for functionality. So what we do uh, with the help of the waveguard is, is a lot of things. First of all, we lower the crossover point to be below the critical hearing range uh, of 2000 or outside uh, the critical hearing range of 2000 to 5000 hertz. The whole speaker building business is a little bit funny. Um, if you look at a sofa or chair manufacturers, they would never put the seam in a cushion in the most visible place. They will always hide it to the side. But for some reason, most of the speaker manufacturers feel that the, that the good place for a tweeter crossover is exactly in the middle of that area where hearing is the best. And this is kind of makes me wonder if we are, if we remember the purpose or why are we developing these products? Are we happy just to get nice measurements out of it so that the measurement microphone is, is happy or, or are we supposed to please the human ear? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, and of course when we can uh, again uh, lower the crossover point to 1600 Hertz it allows us to do a lot of things. First of all, uh, when we are using the tweeter the driver the, with the lowest possible mass in that area where our hearing is, is most sensitive. So of course we can control it in way better than we ever could if we would use it, be using the mid-range midwoofer which is maybe even 50 hundred times the mass. Uh, and, and therefore the transient speed and, and, and the distortion levels are very low. Uh, and, and also uh, even if they do, don't look like that they actually work like point sources because at the crossover point the length of the sound wave starts being longer than the distance between the center points of the drivers. So you, you cannot localize drivers, but, but sense it's a two or three driver combination acting as one. Well. Uh, increasingly important also to make sure that the that, that speaker works in wide range of acoustics, because we are working in treated places, and especially during this time of year, people, or this, this couple of past years, people have been working in their home. Yeah. Which of course the acoustic treatment is not at the level level at all what, uh, what it is in the studios but when we can make sure that also the off-axis responses are healthy so it, it, it's, it doesn't matter, it's still working in, in a predictable manner in, in wide range of acoustical spaces. And, and this is of course now increasingly important when we are going into the immersive world because unless we can integrate our drivers and integrate our channels into a cohesive uh, sound field, the results will never be good. Because it's a little tricky for speaker manufacturer because when it comes to timing phase and, and these kind of uh, cohesion issues, uh, it's very, very easy to achieve a good result on them on a headphone, which is, which is commonly used for, for listening on, on in immersive. And, and I'm as a sound guy, I'm a little bit shocked, I must say, of what kind of uh, results we are getting in the field in this, in this respect. And I think we need to set up a certain reference point that people understand what, what should be uh, the, the targets that we are aiming at. Don't settle for second best. 
people will tell them they can tell the difference we can say they won't but sooner or later it, it's a question of how it feels it's not a question of oh can you can you it is it's deep, deep down music is actually there it's a transfer of emotion from one person to another if you don't feel it and if it's not technically right in terms of phasing and time you won't get the goosebump reaction <laughs> For sure, for sure, and I feel like um, for like especially immersive audio and like things like NFTs, which are huge right now, right? Um, there's a lot of hype too, um, and but at the same time, uh, there are smaller companies and new players coming in that are really thinking about um, the long-term aspect of it and how to actually build. Um, like a sustainable product that will last people for a long time. Um, so what is Amphion currently doing and what is it working on in terms of immersive audio? Are you planning to roll out any products? I mean, we've been we've been setting up rooms all over the world for the past 12 months, 12 months quite in a quite a quite a large level and what's what's been really interesting is that <laughs> kind of the from a marketing point of view, the, the boring, safe, uh, 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 farm-to-table kind of solution uh, in the highest manner has now become, performance-wise, uh, one of the top solutions because the, the situation has totally changed. I mean, the, the, the highest DSP engine is now in a monitor controller. That's where you do all your decisions on. So. My question is, why would you build another DSP layer into the speaker? It's not only getting used, but it's actually detrimental to the products because it will make the whole chain more complicated. So, so we strongly believe that the best synergy uh, today uh, can be achieved by having a top-notch monitor controller uh, and then the highest uh, of the speaker with the highest resolution uh, and, and control dispersion so you can actually get all those minute decisions uh, uh, to, the, to, to, uh, to, to effect in a room. And you also talked a little bit um, at the start, I remember you mentioned that um, it was like a whole journey finding your audience. So yes. Maybe you could talk a little bit more about that. It's really happened. It's a, it's a nice story. I mean, you would you would need to have a lot of money and a very very skilled marketing team to actually come up with something like that. But but we in the speaker building side of things, we have this belief that a or saying that the perfect microphone, oh perfect loudspeaker is a reverse microphone because we they are kind of transducers that are supposed to talk the same language. Uh, there are differences because a lot of mics are used to color which I don't think speakers should do, but, uh, but anyway, this, is an, this was an idea I wanted to look a little bit uh, uh, more carefully into because I don't know any mic and speaker manufacturers that, act, that have actually sat at the ta same table to, to try to do a transducer pair like, like this. And uh, um, by accident, I met a, a, a brilliant uh, a microphone manufacturer uh, Martin Kantala out of Finland, uh, who was in those days uh, teaching, uh, because he he, had, he was the person who had built uh, the microphones for Bruce Woodin. And in those days, he, he would attend uh, in the studio with Bruce Woodin master courses, and, and we, we built a small carry-on case for him to, to play his microphone samples. And, and that particular year, um, they had people like uh, Al Schmidt, Ed Scher, and the Bernie Grunman over there. And um, <laughs> there's a very, very nice uh, video on, uh, on the YouTube where Bruce is listening to, to the prototype the first time and, and, and his reaction uh, of that. And, and then, I mean, it was really funny because Martin then called me late at night and said, hey, how much would this cost? There's people who want to buy this. And I'm like, I don't know. I mean, we just we just built it to you as a carry-on kit, so <laughs> so so you can play your mic samples. Uh, Fifteen hundred a pair, and then he tells me what happened and comes back, and I said, no, 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 no. No, if, if guys of this caliber think we we are onto something, we owe it to ourselves to actually start digging into that in detail. So it took six years to actually between these moments to 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 to, to get the product ready and launch it. But that's it. It's really kind of happened. Half, half and half by accident. Being smart enough to see it though. 
What? Yeah, well, it was pretty evident. <laughs> yeah, but like, uh, Shifu from Kung Fu Panda said, accidents don't happen yeah. accidentally. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, 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 and we've been, even if we worked on the home side, of course, we never kind of felt that we can do anything else but to try to open a large clean window into music because we, we were not a conventional hi-fi manufacturer in a, in a sense that, that, oh, we this Mona Lisa looks a little bit pale now, let's put a makeup on her, that yeah. it will look, she will look hotter then. No, no, I mean, to me, music is sacred, all the, it, you, we, we have no right to touch it. Yeah. We are not there to, to recreate, we are there trying to reproduce. And then of course we, and this made it quite easy also to trans, transition to the, transition to the pro side, because this is really what it's all about hearing what you what you are supposed to hear nothing else I mean I'm uh, speaker building is actually a very good business for for shy Finn like myself because we never wanted to be in the limelight uh, you're perfectly happy you do your job you stay on the sidelines and 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 therefore I mean I always say, tend to say that if a product of this caliber or this kind had any value it's not in how it looks or how it sounds it's in that if it allows the message of music, the message of sound to come through in some ways. And I like I tend to say tell tell to our customers that I'm I'm only happy when we get forgotten. It should it should not be about the gear, it should be about you and your music and, and you feeling what you're doing. And, the, and I think this is the core of the industry. This is why from the from the beginning of times we needed this music that does not give us shelter, does not give fill our stomachs, but that, it does fill our souls. So. Yeah, and I feel like that's why um, the Amphion community finds your product so valuable is because um, it's so honest and it's really raw and you really get to transmit uh, the music and transmit the message behind the music. So I think that's something really powerful. Yeah, well, we can only create the tool. It's up to the user community to come up with the magic, so that's way harder. So. I think there's also, if I may be so bold, there's, sure. there's sort of an approach to your philosophy of audio that I haven't heard a lot of other people talk about. We are a little bit different in that sense, yes, yeah. yes. And I think it's also, it's what's, what's been helpful is, I mean, I've been a puzzle maker all my life. I, I, I even in the in the daycare center, we, we made we made the puzzles that nobody had touched for, for many, many years. and uh, And now that the puzzles are moving so quickly in the modern world I think you need to see the forest for the trees and of course we have a lot of them in Finland so we have a lot of practice <laughs> so we, <you> know, we... <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah. but uh, yeah things are moving moving quickly all the time you have to always always um, think in terms of what would be helpful for the for the user and I and I must also say that one of the things uh, that we are very different about is that it's my belief that if you want to build the world's best hammer you build a prototype and you give it to the carpenter mm. and we we've had this uh, I mean we're thankful for the user community because a lot of the good ideas uh, they come from there I mean they're the ones who are with the with the product all the time even the slogan Beautifully honest. Yeah. It's actually it came from a, from a vocal Grammy winning vocal and it's the last Fox who rent who sent me an email um, after after finding a pair of one eighteen. He said, "Ansi, I'm done with brutally honest. These are beautifully honest." Oh. So I said, "Last, I've been trying to come up with the slogan. Can we use that?" Sure, you can. And this applies to a lot of lot, lot of different things because there's a lot of uh, I mean, and and of course we kind of feel that. Uh, the sound engineers, they're kind of the, uh, to me, they are the, the male equivalent of nurses because um, without the overtime, without any pension, so they're super dedicated, they, nobody comes into this, this field for money. It, it, is, it is a true passion and, and if we can do something to, to help these guys uh, hopefully more ladies in the in the future as well to get through their day and 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 feel good about what they're doing we we I'm a happy man I'm a happy man you made the world a better place <laughs> true, true. and 
I also wanted to talk about uh, the shift into pro audio because to me that's so interesting. You've been doing domestic speakers yes. and then you made the shift in 2014, I believe. Uh, yeah, something like 13, 14. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, and how did that happen? Was it something that you were planning to do for a long time? Was it because you were seeing like the demand from your community? Yeah. It really started. It really started from this moment when when uh, the top of the top guys felt that maybe we have an angle that that is a little bit different from what what uh, normally has been done and then of course we we started working it working with it and and of course the guiding light has always been that it's not really about how the product sounds it's not really about what the engineer hears it's about what the, what their customers hear and and this the fact that the playback side of things changed so quickly. I mean, in the old days, you got it working in the car, little boombox, you got it made, uh, radio play. Of, and, and, but now you have mobile devices, you have flat screen TVs, you have whatever you name it. And, and, and of course, uh, it was necessary to find a way to ensure that that you can your your work translates on these various devices and of course all of them it didn't happen by accident there is a, there is a certain philosophy behind there and and of course all of these playback devices they have a they have a mid range it may be broader it may be more narrow but they do have a mid range and and you need to find a way to seal things so that the problems or challenges in the playback devices won't be able to break that bond yeah. uh, not only in terms of frequency band but also in, in terms of timing and phase which of course are two, two of things most overlooked things in this this business and and this this is really how it how it happened because we knew we needed to offer something else we couldn't i mean the, the we couldn't go head to head with the with the established pro companies the whole idea of oh you know this the whole, this hi-fi and it's like it, it needed it needed to have some substance behind it and 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 of course um we uh we did uh I mean, the Finland is a, is a good place to do these kind of things because nobody in their right mind would ever take a prototype in Los Angeles or London uh, for a, a top-notch production. Yeah. But that, the guys in Finland, they did it. And it was really interesting to, to kind of, because of course you need, I think we did five iterations of, of various balances because it needs to be, uh, provide, it needs to work, but it needs to be close enough to their world that it's not, too, too far of a step to what they're used to, and 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 I'm the basically uh, the results were checked in our own Renault van through the radio uh, play what the guys made on this prototype. So of course I'm I'm super super grateful for these these uh, few crazy ones that actually uh, uh, actually uh, were involved and and uh, it's been interesting. Um, what, maybe the, I mean the name main guy is, is a mastering engineer Henk Niemister out of Finland who is now working a lot broadly in, in UK and stuff like that and, and there's a there's a really funny story I want you to share about about the wide waveguide also because of course when it was time uh, to do a prototype again in a in a um, overly kind of subdued Finnish way my idea was that it should be totally totally black because maybe there's a screen between the speakers so we don't want to bother anybody. So uh, I called the cabinet manufacturer and said that hey let's let's do this kind of thing just this kind of prototype but they said we don't have this material in black can we use white and I said no it, it would it would look really really strange and and uh, then how long does it take to get the black Oh, two weeks. Oh, we don't have two weeks. It's just a sonic prototype. It doesn't matter what it looks like. I send it to Henka. He gives me a call and said, Hansi, whatever you do, don't change the looks. In my 20 years in this business, nobody ever paid any attention to what I was using. Now they go, oh, this is nice. So it's been really funny to look at or to listen to the to the wonderful speculations how they so smartly went for that NS10 look and yeah. uh, but the, with the modern twist come on we were a hi-fi company we didn't even know what an NS10 was 
So I'm a big believer that that by working hard, you 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 can create a bit of go of your own luck, but you still need involvement from Lady Fortuna every now and then. And this is this is that that particular part. Of course now. Now looking back, it's evident because, of course, it, oh, these are popping up everywhere, I mean, especially in the big in the beginning. I'm not sure if they were, but sure, it's so visible you can't you, you can't hide it in the picture. If it's somewhere in the background in the studio shot, you know immediately what, what they're using. So it's it's helped helped a lot. As I said, no logo logos there. <laughs> put out so many amazing products already on the market. What um, What is in plans? What are all the company's next steps? Yeah, it wouldn't be fun if I told you that at this moment. Okay. So, uh, Maybe you could give us a little hint. Uh, I find, I've, I've understood the next NAM is, is already in April. I'm sure we can wait for that. So. <laughs> Uh, but thank you so much once again for joining us and answering all of our questions. It was a pleasure, honestly. Likewise. And thank you so much. And yeah, we'll be looking forward to updates. Great. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Fantastic interview.